It's a priv- privilege now to, this is all about holiness. Even these uh, um, praying for mothers, it's all about holiness. And this understanding the scriptures and obtaining them is about holiness, about Kiddushim. Mm. So thank you, and we look forward to your word this morning. Thank you. <clears throat> Shabbat shalom. Yeah, I'm not sure that I'm the right person to be talking about holiness, but here goes. Hopefully he's given us a word. <clears throat> when most of us get up here to give a word, we're mainly preaching to ourselves because that's where it comes from. He's pointing out to us personally and so if this applies to anybody else besides myself, hallelujah. Praise God. <clears throat> yeah, in the last couple of weeks or so, we've been challenged regarding walking uprightly with Elohim and with our fellow men and women. Are we dead to sin? Are we dead to ourselves? Are we dead to the desires of our own flesh? Are we walking in Yahweh's ways or still our own? This week, that self-examination is continuing as we lead up to Shavuot, Pentecost, and the giving of the Torah and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Last week's parasha was titled, After the Deaths. So is that that the death of self? Because that's what happened with Aaron's sons. They did what they wanted, not what God wanted. This week's parasha is called Kereshim, which means holy people, or as I prefer to call it, set apart people, because holiness, we can have their own conception of that. Set apart, I think, is more precise. So what does a holy or set apart person look like? Do you picture a priest or a nun? or some pastor or some preacher. Or perhaps you imagine a Hasidic Jew and it's with his full beard and side locks and black hat. But Leviticus chapters 19 and 20 contain the Bible's description of what holiness looks like. The passage begins with the words, speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, Yahweh, am holy. That's verse 2. And one of the laws of holiness states that you shall not steal, not deal falsely, nor lie to one another. That's verse 11. Have you ever been ripped off by a religious person, one claiming to be a believer? It's not surprising if we're cheated by people who are of the world, have a worldly worldview, but it is totally disconcerting when a professing believer or an observant Jew deceives or financially abuses us. We expect more from them. We assume that they will conduct themselves and affairs along with his, in line with his moral values. That's what makes us different, the set apart ones, from the secular people. That is what's being holy or set apart is all about. The Torah says that when a religious person conducts himself without integrity, he profanes the name. He profanes God. Profane means to be common or ordinary. And so profane and holy are opposites. 
when a religious person conducts himself no differently than the common ordinary person around him, the people around him, he makes God look common and ordinary too. He damages God's reputation. An unbeliever who steals, deceives, lies, purges and swindles is what one could call unremarkable. But when a believer acts that way, it's a total disgrace. It's a disgrace to his faith. It's a disgrace to God and gives the opportunity for believers to say, you see, he is just like us. I knew there was no substance to his beliefs or his religion. The sages understood that the commandment, you shall not oppress your neighbour nor rob him, in the Leviticus 19.13, to be a prohibition against dishonest business. They understood that it was a prohibit, prohibition against dishonest business transactions. As, as disciples of Yeshua, obedient to God's Torah, we need to strive to be scrupulously honest, especially in matters of business. Bless the introduction. You could almost call, I could almost call it quits there, I think. But I think there's some, there's some other interesting things in the scriptures that we read today. Now, I'm going to skip a whole lot of stuff that I've written. But I just want to make a couple of comments on a couple of the scriptures. In, in Leviticus 19.14, my version says, don't curse the deaf. That's a strange thing to be in the middle of a piece of scripture, isn't it? Why not? Because the deaf can't hear what you're saying and have no opportunity to defend themselves. To me, I'm going to add to the scriptures here, unfortunately, it is cowardice. It is totally cowardly that you attack, that one attacks or criticises a person who cannot defend themselves. That is the way of the world. That is not the way of a set-apart person. Do not put a stumbling block before the blind. Sometimes it's often done by blind people leading the blind. Yeshua had something about that. He says, let the blind lead the blind and both will fall into the ditch. Well, the scriptures also talk in verse 15, all are treated, that all are treated equally. That's the interpretation to, to get justice and right ruling. It doesn't matter who they've got. 10 million bucks or the poor person who are living on the street, whether they live in a palace, whether they're the ruler of the nation, or a person who's living on the street or who's in prison. They all have the same rights. They should all be treated equally. There is no distinction as far as God is concerned. And so as set-apart people, we are to do that. Give no distinction. Now, I just want to make a... Well, there was a comment too about this eating the slaughter. Often, often we, as, as a scientist, I look at things from a scientific point of view. And so when it says, don't eat the meat after three days, I think from a scientific point of view, there's got to be a reason for this. And it's after three days, with no refrigeration, your meat will start to get putrefac putrefaction and you'll end up pretty sick. But that's not the reason God told us not to. He just wants us to be obedient. He wants us to be set apart. And then the other one is in verse 19, where don't breed different animals, etc., together and don't mix. Now, from a scientific point of view, I'm going to make a couple of examples. Don't breed a donkey with a horse. You can, you'll get a mule, but that's all you'll get, because you can't breed mules, they're infertile. So there's no benefit. And the same with a lion and a tiger. You get a liger. It's been done. And again, the liger is infertile. So there's no real benefit. Garments with two sorts of thread. Don't mix cotton and wool. Why? Because the fabric, the fiber is totally different. Cotton is from a plant, wool is from an animal. The plant, the plant fibre is made of cellulose. 
The animal fibre is made of protein. They have different properties, they shrink and expand differently, and a whole lot of other things. One's more, one's more, um, similarly advantageous to you and others aren't. So those are just a set of things. Thought it was interesting about the fruit trees. How often do we plant a fruit tree and expect fruit, of it, fruit from it within a year? <laughs> and then we go out there and prick it. But uh, yeah, it's so tempting enough. But it's for the glory of God to set it apart. That's what happens in year four. Can you imagine waiting five years for a fruit before you can eat it? Hard, isn't it? It is. I know. <laughs> We've got a couple of fruit trees. There's another couple of interesting ones um, about the shaving of your beard, etc. Um, yeah. Now, the reason for that is not for good looks. It is because the pagans did that in certain, for, in, for certain activities in honour of their gods. And so God wants us to be different from the pagans. As simple as that. And he says, do not practice what pagans do. And the same for um, tattooing names of dead people on your skin. That's what, he, that's what that is about, or cutting of flesh. Tattoos, is, um, yeah, some people say no, definitely not, ever. But sometimes I think it can be interpreted that it's related to dead people only, in honour of the dead. It's a matter of what I call, what is called context. But it's between you and God. I'm not going to judge that. Leviticus 20. I'm just going to summarise that chapter. It's basically penalties or curses in relation to certain activities, many of them to do with sexual things, witchcraft, pedophilia, etc., etc. And there's plenty of that going around on this planet at the moment. In verse 7, that's in the first, and in verse 7 he said, he reminds people to be set apart. We're not part of that. Just none at all. Very simple. Then we skip down to verse 22, and he tells us to guard all laws and right rulings and do them. So that the land wouldn't, he tells them, so that the land will not spew them out. Because why that? Because that's what the, it was, the people that were there beforehand, they were being spewed out for exactly that. And he says, don't do that, because otherwise the land's going to spew you out as well. Clean and unclean animals, food laws, what is edible, what is not. Often people get confused when they read Paul and he talks about food, and they think that Paul is talking about modern day food like we have today. You can eat your pig, you can eat this, eat that, eat you know. No. You've got to, some of the context is what who Paul is. Who is writing it and who's he writing it to? Context, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Context is key. There's three rules for, for, for correct biblical interpretation. The first one is context. The second one is context. And the third one is? You've got it. I'll say it whenever. And so you've got to say, who is Paul? Paul is a Benjaminite. He's an Israelite. What is his food definition? And then you'll get the truth. If Paul's food definition is found in Leviticus chapter 11, if you ever want to find it. Very simple. So the food and unclean foods, clean and unclean beasts. And the last one is about Satanism. The definite no no. Mediums and spiritists. I mean, the King Shaul, he went and visited a spiritist, a medium to find, to get to, to talk to Samuel. His kingdom was taken from him. God took it away. No mucking around. Now we come to the prophets. Before we do so, I want to do a, a couple of definitions because um, there was a phrase in there that people might not understand what it says. It was the full tent or full sukkah of David. A lot of this is to do with timelines, and a lot of these names are to do with timelines. You have the timeline before the division of the kingdom of Israel, and the time the the, the 
Well, that's when they were the, the twelve tribes were all together under one under David and Solomon. And it, and it, there's a number of different names that are used or terminologies. One that's called the Kingdom of Israel is sometimes called the full sukkah or full tent of David, the Davidic Kingdom. It's also called the House of Jacob. And it can also be called the whole house of Israel. So those are five different things. So, so when you see those terminologies, always go and have a look at the context. It's got the timeline, because the timeline is your context. And then after the, after the Solomon and the kingdom was divided up, you had the northern kingdom of the ten of the ten tribes. Now there are different names for that. Sometimes it's referred to as the northern kingdom, sometimes it's referred to as the house of Ephraim, sometimes the house of Yosef. And sometimes it's also called the Kingdom of Israel because it was called the Kingdom of Israel and also the House of Israel. But you've got to look at the timeline as to what that actually refers to. And then the Southern Kingdom had the two tribes. And so you had basically, it was called the Kingdom, it was called the Kingdom of Judah, but also called the House of Judah. Now the reason it was called the House of Judah or the house of Ephraim, both of those tribes were the largest tribes and therefore they were, that's what they were, they were, they were called them. So I just thought I'd mention that because it's, it is important when it comes to context and understanding about timelines um, and what the scriptures are actually saying. Amos. Well, what do we know about Amos? Because I'm going to spend a fair bit of time on Amos and Ezekiel because that's a lot of stuff is happening, isn't there? Amos was a Hebrew prophet who lived in the 8th century BC. He's considered one of the 12 minor prophets. And according to the Bible, he was a shepherd and farmer. So he was not just a simple shepherd, he was actually a sheep breeder. He was also had herds of cattle, and he also had orchards of figs. So he was a pretty diverse sort of person. He makes certain that he was not, in those days, there was also what they call the official prophecy schools or schools of prophets. He says, I am not, and they were professionals. And he says, I am not a professional prophet, because sometimes the professional prophets got it wrong. And so he was, um, yeah. Now, he lived in a village called Tekoa, which is isolated about, well, located about five miles south of Bethlehem, or 8K south of Bethlehem, and south, south of Jerusalem. He was called to prophesy, so although he lived in the southern kingdom, he was called to prophesy in the northern kingdom. That often happened. He prophesied against the Israelites for their sins, their idolatry, their social injustice, their oppression to the poor, etc. There's obviously, as a prophet, when you come up like that, you're not well received, so you got, he ended up having to flee back to the southern kingdom to save his skin. Okay, he was temporary, contemporary with other important prophets such as Hosea, Joel, and Isaiah. This is just giving you timelines, which I think are important for understanding. Okay, Amos. Amos 9, verse 7. Oops, I've got marked in my volume. He asked the question of Israel, are you not, are you any different to the various people that were surrounding there? And I can't remember what they were, but never mind. Are you any different to the heathens? Is your behaviour any different to the heathens? That was his challenge to the people. And God said, no, they're not. And so they had to question themselves. And so the question we've got to ask yourselves is, what will our answer be if Yahweh asked us the same question as what he asked them? <clears throat> is our behaviour any different to the pagans? Is our behaviour any different? How will you and I answer that? We've got this a lot of self-examination, and that's that time of the year when we self-examine. It's all part of what, an extension of, are you dead to yourself? But then in, in the last 
six verses of the reading this morning, there is the restoration of Israel. It's very similar to the restoration prophecies of Hosea and Ezekiel. So Amos is a fairly short thing. Ezekiel. How much do we know about Ezekiel? One of the major prophets, well known. First time we read about him in the first verse, he has this massive vision that would blow your mind. He saw Yahweh sitting on a war chariot, which was an amazing piece of equipment because it had four, one set of wheels facing that way, one set of wheels facing that way, and one was inside the other. So how it changed direction, we're not quite sure. But, um, and the wheels were full of eyes. So no matter which way the chariot was facing, it could see everything. What do we know about him? He was in the fifth year. His vision occurred in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's exile. That was about the year 597 BC. We're told that he was a priest. His father was Boozy, or Bootsy. He was a priest as well. So he was a family of priests, all of the priest line of priests. So how old was he when he received his first vision? Now, he was, when he received that vision, he was actually in Babylon. So it was the fifth year of the exile in Babylon. Now, he was a priest. Some people say he was 25 years old. I don't agree. I can't, I can't, that doesn't make sense to me because he would have been made a priest while he was still in Jerusalem. But you don't become a priest until the age of 30. So 30 plus 5 is 35. That's my interpretation of it. So, there are, so that gives us an idea. But he's still a young man in many respects, and he receives this vision that would blow everybody's mind. He it was, it was an exile in Babylon, 825 miles from Jerusalem. That's 1,400 kilometres. And they walked from Jerusalem to Babylon, 1,400 kilometres. Can you imagine doing that? 14, can you walk 1,400 k's? I'm lucky to walk one. That's all right. That's fortunately we've got vehicles and cars and things like that to get us around. <clears throat> okay. So we know a few, a little few things about, about him. He's a priest, so he kept on, tried to keep doing his priestly line. He had a wife. We know nothing about her. We don't know whether he had any kids or anything. He never told a friend. Those are just a few facts. Now, he was called to be a prophet. Now, the way he was called a prophet, it's interesting that when, they, when God called people to be prophets, he didn't ask, would you like to be my prophet? Was there any, um, you know, notice on the synagogue board for volunteers? No. <laughs> you will be my prophet. That's basically how it worked. Think about Paul riding on his donkey up to wherever. He got struck, bang. You will be my apostle to the Gentiles. And so the same happened to Ezekiel. He said, son of man, get on your feet. I'm going to got a job for you. And what a job he had. And that's how Yahweh called, called all the prophets. He called Mose, Moshe from a burning bush. Didn't say, hey, look, I want you to go to Egypt. You are going. The same with Jonah. He didn't say, Jonah, would you like to go to Nineveh? Obviously, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because he went the other way. <laughs> But in the end, Jonah went. He had no choice. <laughs> the fish made sure of that. 
But from a human's perspective, Ezekiel's ministry was sad. Four reasons. And put yourself in Ezekiel's shoes and you'll see how far set apart he really was. And we're only covering four small things. The first, in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 5, we're told that Yahweh told him that the people to whom he would minister would ignore him. And Yahweh repeated that in, in, in chapter 3. The people who would not listen to him, that means the rebellious people would remain rebellious. That's not very exciting, is it? The second piece of sand is that Yahweh told him that he would be mute. He couldn't talk. He wasn't allowed to talk. Now, that's an interesting scenario, isn't it? Through his ministry until the Babylonian army conquered the temple of Jerusalem and Judah, he would not be able to talk to his wife. He would not be able to talk to his kids, that is, if he had any. He would not be able to talk to his friends, that is, if he had any of those as well. And so how did he communicate? Writing? Gets out his chisel and stone and or his papyrus and pen, or sign language. So there's your first user of sign language, Ezekiel. The only time that he could speak was when Yahweh gave him something specifically to say. And then the prophet would speak the word of God. In other words, so he would be mute, a mute prophet, but he could speak with prophetic utterance. So at least he knew what to, what, to, what to expect. Every one of his messages would be prepared for him by Yahweh. So he did not need to write his own messages. The third sad piece was that he would be confined to his house. So that's, what saying. So that's work from home. That's a modern technology. That's a modern thing too. No, he's there it is. Two and a half thousand years ago, work from home, Eze work from home, Ezekiel, and you're not going to talk, and yeah, they're not going to listen to you anyway. The fourth piece of sad news that Yahweh, is that Yahweh would destroy the temple, the city of Jerusalem, and the nation of Judah. He was a priest. Yahweh was going to destroy something that Ezekiel loved dearly, the temple one of the few priests that did in his day. But then Yahweh gave him three pieces of helpful news. No, I said helpful, not necessarily encouraging. First thing in verse, chapter 3, he said, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat the scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me the scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach, fill your body with the scroll which I am giving you. Then I ate it, and it was as sweet as honey. Can you imagine that? So the prophet ate the scroll. So the word of God is as sweet. Sometimes we think it's so bad, but you know, Ezekiel thought it was sweet. Take the scripture, and the other time, take the scripture into your heart. Listen closely to what is read, what you read, and that is how we can be encouraged and be positive in a very, dis in, in a very disappointing ministry. You won't be called to do a ministry; be set apart for a particular purpose. And if you are called, and it's a disappointing ministry, be encouraged. The word of God is there because He's called you to do that. Just be obedient. That's all He wants. Very simple. Be set apart. Don't get all grumpy. Just do it. We must be in his word and listen closely. We must not hurriedly look for a quick fix because it doesn't work. Read his word. Digest his word. The second helpful piece of news was that his bad responsibility. He was given direction, as bad as it was, for him as the reward 
His mercy was one of warning the righteous to not sin and to the wicked to repent and to not continue in sin. Yet even though he warned them, they would not repent. So his ministry would be ineffective. Now imagine if you were in your job and you were being ineffective. What would happen today? You'd be down the road. Get the boot. Yeah. But God doesn't do that. He set you apart. He's called you. The third piece of helpful news that was given was Yahweh promised to strengthen him. It's interesting the Hebrew mood or meaning of Ezekiel's name, which is Yechetzkalei, okay, is whom God will strengthen. If you want to read it, if you want to get some interesting insights of things out of people, look at their names and what it means in the Hebrew, in the Bible. You'll get some amazing stories. You'll get some amazing insights. So how can you can you imagine yourself being a mute housebound prophet that would be ineffective? That would be really encouraging, wouldn't it? And the vast majority of the people to whom he ministered to would die in the next Babylonian invasion. Not exciting. But he was told to announce judgment on his people, his own people, for sacrificing their sons and daughters and food as food to idols and for making their sons work, walk through the fire of Moloch. Moloch. He denounced the sins of the various read. There are different seeds of the wicked readers, false priests, false prophets, from the prophets, prophecy school. Yahweh said Judah would be like a useless vine. What happens to useless vines, useless trees? You chop them out. It was good for nothing. But interleaved in the chapters is also the promise of a restoration. That's not all he went through. He also lost his wife. If you read the story, his, he asked, why did my wife die? And it was as a sign to the priests, the leaders of the nation, that when the temple was destroyed, the death of his wife, they would not, because he was not allowed to mourn for her. That they would not mourn for the loss of the temple, the house of God. That was their reaction. He was signifying the reaction of the people. In other words, he was basically telling them, you're not set apart enough to work. You're not set apart enough to work in my house, therefore I'll destroy it. So, are you called to be an Ezekiel? Do you want to be called to be an Ezekiel? Anybody want to be called an Ezekiel? I don't see any hands. No, I'm not surprised. None of us want to be a messenger like that. Now, as I was reading through this, verse 9 of Ezekiel chapter 20, it says, But I acted for my name's sake, that it should not be profaned before the eyes of the nations among whom they were, before whose eyes I made myself known to them to bring them out of the land of Mitzrayim. This verse struck me. For my 
for the sake of my name. It was for the sake of his name that he did not destroy the nation of Israel. Why? And it goes on and says, um, I'm going to say, lost my place here. So that it should not be profaned before the eyes of the nations. And I thought, well, that's okay. Is God vain? Is he proud? No. There's a further reason. And it came like a lightning bolt. There are three reasons why he would not allow his name to be profaned. And there's three reasons why we shouldn't allow it to be profaned either. If Yahweh allowed his name to be profaned, which means to be made common or nothing, he would have been breaking Exodus 20, verse 7. You do not bring the name of Yahweh your Elohim to naught, for Yahweh does not leave the one unpunished who brings his name to naught. That's interesting. So he would have allowed his own name to be brought to naught. Therefore, he'd have to punish himself. That doesn't make sense, does it? Secondly, if Yahweh had allowed to, that to happen as lawmaker, he would have broken his own law. So that's a lesson for every, all the lawmakers on the planet. Don't break your own laws. It applies to you as well. It's an example for all of us. The third thing was that he did to, was to protect us from doing the same thing. That's the third thing. He did it so that we wouldn't do it. He protected us from being sinful. He protected us from his punishment. And so I found that rather interesting. It just, it was funny, I, I did that on the, I came across that on the Thursday night. And first thing I woke up on Monday, Friday morning was, that was the first phrase that came to my head, for his name's sake. And I thought, wow, because being set apart is all for his name's sake. That's what being set apart is all about. Verse 11, it says, we sh he shall live by them. What does it mean? Is it an instruction or is it a blessing? Actually, it's both. Often it's taken as a command and gets a somewhat negative response from a rebellious natives, uh, nature. Well, mine anyway, sometimes, you know. And, uh, but I've come to the positive response. If we live by Torah, it will be a blessing to us. It is life. It is the principles of life. And so one responds in relation to it because it's referred to in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 5 and 15 to 16. See, today I've set before you life and good, death and evil. Oops. And that I'm commanding you today to, to love Elohim. Yahweh your Elohim, to walk in his ways and to guard his commands and his laws and his right rulings. And you shall live and increase, and Yahweh your Elohim shall bless you in the land which you go to possess. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And 19, I have called the heavens and the earth as witnesses today against you. I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse, therefore you shall choose life, so that you live both you and your seed to love, etc. And he continues on, it equal turns on, continues on to observe the Sabbaths, because they have meaning, the Moedim. They're so important. And that's what's being set, that's part of the set apartness. We follow his Moedim, those special days, those Sabbaths, when we can rest in him and praise him and worship him. The Sabbaths. It's a sign between me and the children of Israel 
forever. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth on earth and the rest of it. It is Yahweh who sets us apart, not us. He sets us apart. We just got to respond. Unfortunately, I don't think I've got time to go through the New Testament, but New Testament's the parts and notes that I've made, but that's all right. But how set apart are we? How set apart are we? Be set apart. We're going to need that. We're going to make in the future. We're going to need to make that decision. How set apart am I? Am I going to stand for God? Am I going to work and stand for Him? Because that time is coming, folks. And I just pray that every one of us can do so. And I want to finish with the words that Joel said first thing this morning from Psalm 119. So that we are set apart. It's, it, is, it is the process of being set apart. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and I confirm to guard your righteous rulings. I have been afflicted very much. But, O oh Yahweh, receive me according to your word. Please accept the voluntary offerings of my mouth, O oh Yahweh, and teach me your right rulings. My life is in my hand continually, and your Torah I have not forgotten. The wrong have I laid a snare for the wrong have laid a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your order. That's being set apart. That's being set apart. Your witnesses are my inheritance forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I have inclined my heart to do your laws forever to the end. That's set apartness to the extreme. Living that as Yahweh's Robert has put it. It's not worldly, it's heavenly. Heaven and earth are separated. The only thing I'll leave that, but we need to be set apart in the near future. Boy, we need to be set apart now just to get to strengthen that set apartness. Because Yeshua's return is close. Have we the heart for that? I leave that for you to decide. It's between you and Yahweh. And so thank you for listening. Shabbat shalom. was great Kevin certainly lots of lots to think about
Every Mother's Day. Ya verkha Adonai va yismerkha Ya er Adonai panavlakha va khunikha Isa Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. Had an I turn his face to you and grant you peace. Go in his strength. Recognize the importance of being whom he's created you to be. His desire is that you walk right before the people you work with, the ones you live with the ones who are your neighbors. This is requirement is being holy as he is holy. So they will see for his name's sake who the almighty God is. So they'll turn to him when they're in difficulty. They'll turn to him when they see all the great things that are happening for them that they will turn to him because of the beauty that's around. They'll turn to him because of, just because the day is shining and recognize that he is the creator. He's the designer of all things. And his design is to, and and, and, and desire is to, to love and to be with people and for them to be with him. So let us be people of trust and hope, people bringing shalom, people who are living pure and holy in his ways so the world will see who he is. Enjoy the day. Shabbat shalom. Yeah.